Thank you very much indeed, Grant, for that welcome to this, my college and its uh, annual scientific meeting. It's a great honour to actually be invited to, to give this oration. Um, I remember Priscilla well. I trained with Priscilla. In fact, Priscilla told me that I wanted to be a nephrologist. I didn't have any choice in the matter at the time. Uh, she was that sort of a strong leader. Um, one of the reasons that I did move some 12 years ago from a clinical academic career into management, uh, both as a hospital CEO and now in this current role, was because I have a great, strong belief that system reform is, needs to be clinician-led. And there's probably no better group of clinicians to lead reform than physicians. As we all know, we have a world-class health system with fantastic research, a great academic culture, but our system is in constant need of reform, uh, no more so than now if we're going to sustainably maintain its quality and access and new technologies into the future. So it's fitting that the topic of clinician leadership uh, starts with Priscilla. That's how I remember Priscilla. She turned around for the microscope to give a biopsy report at the same time tell you how to manage the patient. She was actually a very, very powerful pathologist as well as a physician. She was also a very strong uh, medical leader. I remember asking her once why at the Royal Melbourne Hospital they used to have a different type of dialysis staff, the dialysis technician. It was a non-nursing staff that were perhaps trained more quickly and uh, used to replace nurses in most of the dialysis units. It was a unique Royal Melbourne phenomenon. And I said to her once, why did you create this new workforce? She said, well, nursing administration tried to tell me how to roster the staff. I wasn't having any of that, so I got rid of nurses. Now, that, that may not be quite so easy these days uh, with the unions and the politics, but uh, she was a pretty formidable leader. One of the things, the themes of today is that I think fellows of this college have played a huge role and are currently playing a huge role in reform and system change and system improvement. And I hope you recognise some of the, the photos of fellows of the college as we move through. So system reform is really challenging. As I said already, we have a really good health system with uh, excellent outcomes. But there is, as we all know, significant challenges to sustainability into the future. And I think everybody accepts that reform is required, but it's very difficult to actually bring about reform. Particularly when governments lead reform, uh, it's a very difficult place. It's politically contested. The media uh, plays sometimes a non-helpful role in uh, creating anxiety about reform. Often the politics and the media lead to policy compromises and half implemented uh, outcomes. We have a lot of strategies. There have been lots of reform strategies published that are sitting on shelves, only partly implemented. One of the views that it pervades in some sections of government, which I would strongly contest, is that stakeholder resistance kills reform. And included in those stakeholders, as shown in that cartoon, are the medical profession. I would strongly dispute that contention. I think the reason that state clinical stakeholders sometimes are difficult to bring on the journey of reform is because we haven't adequately engaged them and given them a meaningful role in that reform journey. Clearly, the medical profession is the most influential stakeholder. And one of the things that I've discovered in my last six months uh, in this chief medical officer role is just how powerful the medical leadership we have now, mainly from fellows of this college, in bringing about reform. So the talk, um, I'm just going to really focus on four perhaps random areas where I want to demonstrate in a very practical and current time sense the role that physicians should play in system reform. And the first thing I had to talk about is the perennial challenge of uh, financial sustainability. Related to that, I think in many ways, is our challenges with the medical workforce. I was asked to mention briefly the obesity challenge, a topic about which I know almost nothing, um, but uh, because it's going to be a key feature of this morning, I was asked to give some reflections from my role, and perhaps because I'm responsible for 
the Australian government's response to global health threats, it could fit into that uh, category fairly readily. And if we have time at the end, I'll probably discuss some of the physician leadership, as we heard from Ross before, that's required in the topic of antimicrobial resistance. So firstly, on to sustainability. Now, we're all familiar with these graphs showing that the, cost, the rate of rise of growth in the cost of health expenditure is consistently higher than the growth in GDP. And clearly, that situation, if unchecked into the future, just leads to more and more share of government revenue being spent on health and a mathematically impossible outcome in the end where we, we are not able to continue to provide the current access to high quality care and more particularly access to new and exciting technologies, which will be a, an important thing I'll mention in a minute. You've noticed that the growth in rising health costs has fallen a little bit in recent years, and that's because governments have had to introduce some savings to match the decline in GDP and government revenue. But the gap between the two lines remains. We're now spending more than 10% of our GDP on health. Uh, this, that's not, it's over the OECD average. There's nothing wrong, there's no sp particular right amount of, o of GDP you should spend on health, but we have to be able to match what we spend on health with our capacity to pay. And as you can see from that graph, that's clearly uh, an, an, a long-term unsustainable situation. We heard mention that of the challenges of chronic disease and ageing this morning, and absolutely they are important uh, parts of the story. But as you can see from those graphs, which show at the top the rate of growth in the growth in health expenditure, uh, in the top graph the per person growth in the next green graph below, and again that gap between GDP growth in the black line, they're much higher than the rate of population growth and the rate of ageing growth. And we also know that although chronic diseases are increasing, the, the burden of chronic disease is not increasing at the same rate as before because we're managing it better. So there's very clearly factors other than ageing and chronic disease that are contributing to the rate of rise in healthcare costs. Some of those relate to technology, some of those relate to workforce and a number of other topics that I'll come to. So what I want to do is talk a little bit about some very practical things that physicians can do to help us in cost containment for the future. We know that there's work being done on models of care to help better provide care for people with chronic disease, work such as healthcare homes, work such as the substitution models for admission-based care that many of the state public hospital systems are trying. They are wonderful models and they will probably deliver better quality care they are very unlikely to deliver significant cost savings in the short term, uh, but will probably would be predominated by improvement in quality of care. The challenge that I want to put to all physicians, or in fact all clinicians, uh, is that we need to make savings earlier than these models of care will deliver, and not for the sake of delivering to government budget repair. The medical profession perhaps isn't heavily motivated by the AAA credit ratings and the state of the federal budget. What motivates the medical profession is the need to provide continued access for our patients to new technologies, new pharmaceuticals and new uh, clinical therapies. These things are what drive us into the future. And I think perhaps it's not widely appreciated that one of the ch reasons we've been able to maintain uh, good access to these things in recent years is because we have realised some short-term savings in recent years, and I'll come to those in a minute. So the challenge for us today is to look at two, two areas uh, in the sustainability challenge that have been highlighted in the recent OECD summit in January this year, where, uh, the, the wasteful spending in health and the challenge of new technology evaluation. The OECD uh, concluded that uh, after looking at quite a lot of data that about 20% of the health expenditure is wasted by paying too much, doing unnecessary work, uh, avoidable errors and many other things. And we all know, all of us in our, in our clinical life know that new technologies are coming all the time and they're exciting and obviously expensive and need proper evaluation. This slide uh, I 
we kind of got from Adam Ilshaw, who uh, has adapted some work from two US economists who have sort of categorised uh, care into sort of three classes. Clearly the category one, the university high value care, where just about everybody exposed to that care will benefit from it. Such things as antiretroviral therapy for HIV. Down the bottom, the university low value care, where almost nobody benefits from the care. And I would venture to suggest that things like arthroscopy for uncomplicated osteoarthritis of the knee would fall into that category. Then in the middle, there's the grey zone, where clearly some people benefit from the care and some people don't. And the grey zone is the contested area where clinician choice and patient choice is so crucially important. But where we uh, need to focus, I think, and where we have been focusing through some Commonwealth-led programs is in the category three, the low-value care, where, in, where the space is not so contested and where it's possible to use regulatory and uh, clinician choice and patient choice uh, strategies to reduce the wasteful spending in low-value care. So the first of these is uh, the Pharmaceutical Benefits Advisory Committee, and here's our first fellow of the college. Um, people perhaps don't realise just how successful the PBAC process has been. One of the reasons we've been able to continue to reinvest in new pharmaceuticals has been the huge savings that the PBAC has achieved and the PBS has achieved in the last few years. Nearly $6 billion in savings to the Commonwealth budget through price disclosure, the introduction of generics and other initiatives. This has led to some huge outcomes, reductions in prices of drugs like docetaxel of 90%, and the capacity for us to introduce exciting new things like the hepatitis C medication costing nearly $2 billion a year. Some people might not remember that it was, wasn't all that long ago that PBAC recommendations for new and expensive therapies just sat on the table, waiting sometimes several months for government to implement. We now have government policy which says that once the PBAC recommends a, a treatment, no matter the cost, <coughs> it, gets, it gets listed. But the only reason that's possible is that the PBS has, for the last several years, been able to find sufficient headroom by savings and by rigorous cost-effective analysis of new drugs to fund the new drugs. People don't, aren't aware that this is the case. And if government is not in a position, government has no more money to throw at the PBS. And so unless we find headroom, uh, it's going to be very difficult to continue to fund these drugs into the future. One of the biggest opportunities that I see in this space is the uptake of biosimilars, and I'm uh, unashamedly advocating for that for an audience where I believe there might be a fair bit of biological uh, prescribing. Biological drugs now uh, account for about $3 billion a year in health expenditure in Australia, about a third of the PBS spend. The patents are expiring, and these drugs uh, are now facing competition from biosimilars. In some countries, like Scandinavia, they've had price reductions of well over 50% and spend reductions of that order in biologicals. In Australia, we're facing some interesting resistance from some clinicians who have some concern about the, uh, the perceived safety of switching, despite the fact that evidence is now pretty strong that it is safe to switch and that perhaps the batch to batch variation between one batch of a biological is not much uh, different to the variation between one drug and its biosimilar equivalent. So this potentially, by giving the biosimilars uh, and other generic drug competitors a fair share of the market, not a monopoly, everyone wants the originator of the drugs to continue to have their place in the sun, but by up increasing uptake of biosimilars, we will achieve huge and substantial changes. But if they're not given a fair share of the market, they simply won't come to Australia. It's an expensive process to put things through the PBAC, and we will lose out on that huge benefit. Benefit that we need to make room, as I've already said, for the huge ar array of new drugs. Just in oncology alone, it is just mind gobbling how much there is in new drugs in the pipeline that offer very exciting but very expensive potential treatments. So the next part of the sustainability challenge uh, is in uh, Medicare. <coughs> 
Now, Medicare is the cornerstone uh, of our health system, and it's very nice that it is unequivocally and supported across the whole political divide in this country, and it has to be also sustainable. The Medical Services Advisory Committee is another hugely exciting uh, project, pro sorry, process, led again by a fellow of this college, that ensures that the very complex evaluation of new technologies and new services uh, is subject to cost-effective evaluation to enable us to actually be able to afford them to get the best possible price, to get the right indications and to make sure that they're cost-effective. It depends on very strong scientific evaluation and involves many other clinicians as well in the process. Examples of a new technology that's recently been through MSAC include cardiac MRI, the uh, transcatheter aortic valve replacement, uh, interesting new stents for glaucoma which are being evaluated at the moment, and we're just starting to see the first of the tsunami of genetic tests that will be put up to the M MSAC for review. And again, unless we can find room for them, that will be difficult to fund. So finding room is part of the uh, challenge of another Commonwealth-led process, led again by another fellow of this college and ably assisted by probably a few hundred other fellows, um, looking at the current MBS schedule where most items, less than 3% of items on the current MBS have ever been subject to a formal cost effectiveness evaluation. And we know that we need, if we're going to have a sustainable system, we need to have the same sort of right care evaluation lens placed over all of the MBS items. Care that's needed, wanted, clinically effective, affordable, equitable and responsible. So examples of the sort of things that are being looked at are where there's variation in care, where care is currently non-evidence-based, and where care no longer aligns with clinical guidelines. So some things that are being looked at at the moment are uh, the role of arthroscopy and even MRI in uncomplicated osteoarthritis of the knee, the increasing uh, concern that colonoscopies are being done outside of clinical guidelines with people uh, who don't have any appreciable risks. The uncontrolled expenditure in IVF where there is no age cap or cycle cap, but where people over the age of 45 have an almost negligible success rate. Where some simple office procedures can, uh, can be done in offices and shouldn't be uh, funded to be performed in hospitals. All of these things are contested to some extent in that there will be some stakeholders uh, affected if government accepts recommendations that come out of the consultation and the review. And the process is a very consultative one. Changes will only be accepted by government if there is a strong uh, con consultation process and if all people's voices are heard. But if some of these changes do come to fruition, there will inevitably be some stakeholder concern. And uh, we expect that that will be another situation where clinician leadership to support the changes uh, will be necessary in the desire of physicians and other clinicians to make sure that we create room in our system for the new technologies that are cost effective and are appropriate and will benefit our patients. So enough on the, the money story, um, although this does relate a little bit to my next topic of medical workforce reform. Uh, reform and the challenges in the medical workforce. This is a very interesting slide. One of the one cost driver of the medical benefits expenditure is workforce, and this shows a very interesting and somewhat alarming trend in the rate of urgent after-hours services being featured in the media, uh, given by non-vocationally registered uh, GPs. Now, most of these, we believe, are actual young. Australian graduates who are currently in a position of not being in vocational training. Some of them are waiting for vocational training, some of them are not sure of their future, but this is providing um, an income source in these corporatised practices which pay a fairly high MBS rate. The rate was originally determined to get uh, 
ordinary GPs who work during the day out of bed during the night, and it's an appropriately high rate, but it's being used in this corporatised model uh, and it's putting huge pressure on the MBS at the moment uh, and as an un unintended consequence. But possibly the main driver for that is the, the barriers to vocational training that we are now seeing in some young doctors who are waiting some time to get into vocational training. Which leads me to my next question to pose to you is, are we in medical workforce oversupply? Being a, now a public servant, I can't say anything definitively, and uh, um, because it gets reported. Um, but I can, and I can say that at the moment I'm currently chairing uh, the National Medical Training Advisory Network, and that group uh, is not in a position yet of calling oversupply. But I'd have to say that a, a majority of their members believe that we are heading in that situation. We should say at the outset, though, that the distribution problem is still not solved. There are still vacancies for specialist anaesthetists in Cairns. There are still vacancies for ENT surgeons in the Gold Coast and for general practitioners in very remote areas. But if you look at those graphs, the, uh, we're getting close to 100,000 doctors in the black line with the uh, axis on the right. If you look at the other growth below that, you can see that we're adding about 5,000 new doctors to the medical profession in Australia every year, about 3,500 um, new gr Australian graduates and about roughly 1,500 still overseas trained doctors. And clearly our exits are much less than that. The rate of growth in, in the medical workforce is significantly higher than the rate of growth in the population. And now we now have a doctor to population ratio which is significantly in excess of that of many other OECD countries. The National Medical Training Advisory Network has been modelling this by specialties and it's pretty clear that there are differences between specialties. Those that have a very high service uh, requirement in hospitals such as emergency medicine are clearly because of their service training uh, creating far too many uh, fellows for the employment opportunities in the future whereas others like one of my favourite physician specialties rheumatology uh, because they have very few training positions because of the hospital service needs being less are likely to still f be facing a shortage into the future. So the challenge we have is we're reluctant to call an oversupply whilst there are still unfilled jobs. But there is pretty much, there's, there's a fair bit of evidence that we have a problem. Look at uh, general practice, and it's, this is probably a good news story that we now really have a pretty adequate general practitioner supply uh, to the population. And I'm not showing on this slide, but we have actually largely improved the geographical distribution except for the most remote areas of the country. All of the areas up to the last two, uh, remote and very remote, now have pretty similar general practitioner numbers, although the more uh, regional do have probably an, uh, an over-reliance on overseas doc trained doctors to make up their, their numbers. We now have consistent oversubscription to the general practitioner training program and the colleges of general practitioners gen are generally of the view that they feel there's no need to create more places because they feel that we are, may, may well be heading into an oversupply situation in their specialty too. One of the challenges that we're looking at in the medical training advisory network is this transitional generation. The, the group of doctors who have finished internship but are not in vocational training. There are nearly 10,000 of those doctors and there's also another 6,000 or so of non-vocationally registered GPs who are probably also doctors in that uh, limbo land. And we know that at least 6,000 of the doctors working in hospitals that aren't in vocational training really want to work in vocational training. And as fellows of this college know, a large number of those express the view to work in adult medicine and we all know the challenges of the large numbers of people sitting the first part physician's exam. In my last job as CEO of Austin Health we would regularly have 50 candidates sitting the clinical exam which was a huge logistical challenge and creates huge challenges for the college into the future. So what do we need to deal with this issue? 
Well, we need collaborative action uh, because no one has, has the levers. The levers are in the hands of hospitals who are, in some extent, influenced by state governments. Uh, the Commonwealth has a big role in general practitioners and the colleges have a crucial role in training. So the, the, we need all of the presidents of the colleges and all the colleges working together. We need health ministers to agree on strategies. And we have perhaps lost a bit of focus on the health workforce in the last few years. Um, but it's time for us to place a really good focus on our medical workforce if we're going to make sure we don't end up with perverse outcomes. We do need to carefully review the migration pathways again, not to, uh, not to making sure we don't create unintended consequences in those areas where they're still needed, but, but to make sure that migration pathways are being used to really address areas of needs and perhaps not the corporate needs of, of various operators. We've got to look at a role for the non-training medical workforce. We simply cannot staff uh, our hospitals uh, with doctors who are entirely undertaking fellowship training. We have to disconnect the training numbers or the training requirements of the future from the service requirements of our health services. We also have to think about those specialties that are significantly still struggling to attract people. Why is it that psychiatry is still so unpopular that a significant proportion of its trainees have to be overseas trained doctors, where psychiatry has such plentiful job opportunities into the future? So a good example of this um, is uh, a hospital service workforce with the College of Emergency Medicine. This college is very upfront. They've accepted that whatever way you cut the data, whatever way you project it, they have no chance of having enough jobs for the fellows uh, that are going to be produced unless they change their training pathway to create significantly fewer facems into the future. And they accept that the service needs of their of emergency departments, which have largely depended on training registrars need to be met in other ways. There may need to be a role for career medical officers, perhaps people waiting for entry into other programs and various other workforce models. We cannot end up with a generation of underemployed emergency physicians. They are in a particular challenge because they don't even have the private practice opportunities that some other specialties do, where in, to some extent uh, they can create their own demand. But at the other end, of course, we need to do more about my, one of my favourite specialties of rheumatology. We need more rheumatologists. It's no, there's no value trying to get the hospitals to take more positions if the training opportunities aren't there and significant private practice training, which needs to be supported by the levers that, uh, the, that the Commonwealth can provide, is going to be necessary. And then we face the, the challenge of the rural and regional areas. And there's been a lot of money and effort getting doctors out of the cities. And as I've already said, we've had a fair bit of success in general practice and in some specialties, and the situation is definitely better. But there are still problems in remote and very remote areas, still a, an over-reliance on overseas trained doctors, and we still have problems retaining people in the regional areas. We've used the strategy of getting undergraduate student training and internships into the non-metropolitan areas and we've probably maxed that out to the extent that we can. The challenge is that people who want to do specialty training uh, will generally come straight back to the big cities once they've finished their internship because that's the way they see the future opportunities. What we need to do is to create vocational training opportunities that are based in non-metropolitan areas to keep people there and keep them uh, in the experience of training and working in the non-metropolitan areas. And the College of Surgeons has shown uh, a significant leadership in this space, creating a Western Victorian based training program where people are selected and based in the Western regional towns, but rotate in for a few terms into specialties in, in the city hospitals. So it's a very different paradigm from people rotating out for rural experience. And that's the sort of thing we're going to need. But colleges are going to need to be much more flexible with their accreditation requirements for training positions if we're going to pull that off. So that's my little medical leadership in workforce. Now, as I said already, obesity is something that um, uh, I don't know an awful lot about, and my, I'm really looking forward to the sessions this morning on this topic, and I noticed there are international experts like Boyd Swinburne talking. Um, but I, again, it's what I will say in these few slides is just a high-level 
reflection on, on the role of, I think, of physicians in leadership for change. The problem has been well described, and I think most of you will have read that excellent Lancet series in 2015, which really describes the issues beautifully. And I think it's probably true to say that no country has reversed the epidemic, although some countries seem to have made strategies uh, that, are, that potentially could be quite exciting. One of the challenges, I think, is that we have to, to some extent, disconnect the challenge of managing the currently obese adult population with the, prevention, the broader prevention strategy, because they have some differences in approach. There is probably no issue that I can see at the moment in greater need of clinical leadership. If you look at that uh, little diagram down the bottom, this is Mark Moore, who's a public policy expert uh, from the US, who talks about how to get public sector change. And to get public sector change that's government-led, you need really three things. You need to demonstrate public value, and I think we probably have demonstrated the public value of making a change in obesity, but you also need to show organisational capacity to deliver that change, and we're not there yet in our obesity approach, and you need broad community legitimacy and support. And I would again say that that's probably lacking in our obesity debate at the moment. I get some random thoughts I've had from reading uh, and talking to some people like Joe Peretta, who's a, a national expert in this space. I think it's true to say, that, and the Lancet series covered this, that there is a very unhelpful dichotomy between the view on the one hand that obesity is a problem of personal choice and the, in and the individual just has to make the right cho choices versus the alternative view that the individual is powerless and it's a system problem and the system has to fix it. And we've even seen that play out uh, in the media recently in this country. Now, as everybody who thinks carefully knows, the truth is in the middle. People, of course, have choices, but the extent to which they're able to exercise those choices depends very significantly on their, in their own circumstances, including their genetic and epigenetic milieu. <clears throat> so any strategies that we think have, have to have an interaction between the individual and the, and the environment in mind. The Lancet series indicated beautifully how you need a whole systems approach because simp sim simple single strategies will have impacts on other factors and you need to be able to plan a, a, a whole sector strategic approach. One of the challenges that I think the CPMC uh, did that when they did their report uh, last year were, was challenging government for, for greater action. It's hard for government to go into a contested space, particularly when you've got uh, uh, regulatory proposals that might be contested uh, without broad community support. Governments will tend to want to go for safer options, such as uh, programs that aren't contested, like promoting exercise and community education, which some would argue are less effective, although a very exciting piece of news was that we, ne we had in 2016, for the first time, a 3% reduction in soft drink sales in supermarkets. So education of some sort is doing something. People often uh, draw analogies to the tobacco campaigns, but they are very different. Uh, tobacco is not part of life, food is part of life. So it's, a, it's an interesting uh, and significant challenge that I think the medical pr profession needs to lead a community and civic drive for change if, they're going to, if they want to achieve regulatory outcomes. So if you think about uh, the currently obese, and uh, this is some of the work that Joe Pareto's done, um, most people, as we know, can lose significant amounts of weight. Uh, very few can keep it off. There's a huge and long-lasting endocrine response, and that graph of Joe's shows the higher levels of ghrelin that persists a year after people have lost weight. There are a whole range of uh, mediators that promote the return of this previous weight uh, by promoting appetite. And it's, it's very, very difficult. Very few people can keep that weight off. There may be a role for pharmacological agents, uh, even in combination, in keeping the weight off, perhaps more than there is a role for pharmacological agents in, uh, in getting weight off in the first place. I think there is clear evidence that there's a role for bariatric surgery, and it, uh, the big challenge in that space is that we don't have particularly good access in our state 
public hospital systems at the moment. And there is an, an inherent dislike mentally in most of us for a surgical approach to this problem. The CPMC report called for new Medicare items and new PBS listings to help with obesity. And again, as I've already pointed out, we have robust PBAC and MEMSAC process. And if there are cost-effective interventions, then they should be put up to those committees and they will get a very thorough hearing because if they are effective, they will be shown to be cost-effective. Clinical leadership in reversing the epidemic is the big challenge and I again hope to, to hear a lot more uh, from the experts later this morning. This broader prevention agenda uh, we've seen in some countries and like Mexico where a broad civic coalition uh, which has been informed and engaged by the health profession but has been driven to a large extent by citizens and community actions they will create that legitimacy and support that will lead governments to take actions that they might otherwise uh, find difficult to do, particularly in a regulatory sense. So I, I would challenge most of the medical profession to get involved in this space. I think some of us, and I was the same in clinical practice, became a bit nihilistic about the obesity epidemic. We were just so overwhelmed with the number of overweight people we were seeing that we seemed to stop wanting to do something in a broader sense, and if there's a broad community support, it will need medical leaders to, to drive it. Very important for government is before they take actions, they need evidence of outcomes. And as, as yet, and again, maybe I'll hear more later today, there's not a lot of evidence of true outcomes of many of the uh, most brave interventions. And governments will be reluctant to take contested measures unless there's evidence of outcomes uh, and unless they're reassured ab about adverse consequences. One thing that became completely clear to me from reading the literature and talking to people about this topic is that there is not a broad community awareness of the criticality of those early years of life. It would seem, and I hope I hear more about this today, that that antenatal uh, pregnancy and early postnatal environment is probably the most important place for us to intervene. And I don't think the community is aware of that at the moment, and it's one of the duties of us as clinicians to make them aware of us. As I've seen in things like maternal pertussis immunisations, mothers will do just about anything if, if they believe it's going to improve the future of their children. And I think there's a huge opportunity for us to work in those early years of life. And I would be very keen to see strategies presented to government that focus on getting that message through to people contemplating having children. I don't have, I've only got a few minutes left, so I'm just going to briefly touch on uh, antimicrobial resistance because I think, as Ross mentioned earlier, this is an area where we need absolute clinician leadership. Um, we know the problem pretty well now in Australia. We're a bit different from other countries. We have very high VRE rates, but currently not particularly problematic uh, CRE rates. Um, we have shown that by restricting fluoroquinolone access, we have one of the lowest rates in the world but we have one of the highest rates of community prescribing in general practice. Uh, we ha still have significant problems with uh, inappropriate surgical prophylaxis in hospitals. Uh, and we have a huge use of antibiotics in aged care where they seem to be used as a first line treatment of dementia for, by some people. So um, the, the challenge is there. We know what to do. Um, governments get it. Every government gets it. Politicians get this challenge. Um, one of the frightening statistics has been that only one pharmacological only one pharma company is now left in antibiotic development. The, 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 the other one that was in there pulled out just earlier this year because there's no money in it. So governments are in trying to invest in new drugs, but we have to do something serious about our stewardship. We've got an, some, some good progress already. We've got a Centre for Antimicrobial Stewardship at the Doherty in Melbourne. We've got uh, some good action from NPS MedicineWise. The Commission for Quality and Safety is producing our oral report. We've got a national strategy, but we need some very strong clinical leadership, particularly to help primary care develop a stewardship approach. Uh, and some regulatory measures, maybe we should stop allowing repeat prescriptions on antibiotics, maybe we've got to ban some antibiotics from animal use. 
and we need a community education program that works, probably focusing on the risks to the individual rather than the risks to the community because people often get that personal risk more than they do a, a nebulous community concept. So finally, very briefly, these are the, what I think the college fellows, it's a bit of a call to arms. I think we, we all need to self-reflect. Are we in fact walking the talk? Do we actually always practice good stewardship or are we also, like our general practitioner colleagues, prone to give antibiotics when they may not be absolutely necessary? I think we have to really believe that the problem is there. I, I see some colleagues, medical colleagues, say, oh, always be it. there's always one more antibiotic and it may not be thus. The untreatable CRE patient in the US is, was uh, a salutary lesson in that regard. I've heard of transplant programs in Greece now that have just been shut down for months because of uh, problems with uh, CRE uh, colonisation. We need, we, most, a lot of physicians have a close role with surgeons. We need to make sure that we exercise stewardship and uh, forcefully mention to our surgical colleagues, colleagues when they're using inappropriate drugs or, as is commonly the case, using them for too long. We need to support our general practitioners. Every time we see a general practitioner prescribing that we think could be done differently, we need to reinforce that message. And we also need to play a role in the community message. And for God's sake, let's, let's show some proper leadership in hand hygiene. As doctor rates are still uh, about that of cleaners in hospitals. Every other health professional has got up there. And the only way to get our young doctors to practice good hand hygiene is for their bosses to show and set an example. So thank you for your attention. Uh, this is a great college. This is the College of Leaders for Change into the Future. And uh, I'm looking forward very, with great excitement to working with many of you in the leadership challenges in, in my next four and a half years in this role. Thank you for your attention.